Welcome to Challenging Climate, a podcast where we discuss the science, technology, and politics of climate change. I'm Pete Irvin, a climate scientist. And I'm Jesse Reynolds, an environmental policy expert. Each episode, we bring on a guest with a unique perspective and deep expertise on climate change and put challenging questions to them. In this episode, we spoke with Degemar de Groot, or uh, Dagemar de Groot, who is a Dutch-Canadian historian of climate, or climate historian, that um, studies how climate and other environmental changes have affected society through time. And it's really interesting. We, we talked about what can historical archives tell us about what the climate of the past was, and spent more of our time thinking about the ways in which climate has affected society, and how that's been maybe misunderstood in the past, and some of the biases in the field. How the kind of careful historical analysis that Degemar does can reveal the ways in which societies struggled or thrived as the environment changed around them. And what's clear, in as much as anything can be clear, from a field such as history, climate, and society, I believe, is societal responses to changes in climate vary. On the one hand, there are plenty who have struggled through climate change if not at times collapsing. And those may receive disproportionate amount of attention, both in the academic field and in the popular conversation. But as his case study shows, the Netherlands, or at the time the Dutch Republic, which is located in a relatively cold part of the world, thrived during a relatively cold period in the world climate. So at the very least, this evidence can and should catalyze fresh thinking about how the world may muddle through future climate change. Yeah, and um, although we didn't quite end on an optimistic note, Digmar did give his perspective that we're not doomed. There's everything still to play for for climate change, but it's going to be tricky. But yeah, great conversation. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks for listening. We are joined by Dachemar de Groot, an associate professor at Georgetown University, where he studies how communities have responded to past environmental changes. Alongside his academic work, which has been published in Nature and the American Historical Review, Dachemar writes popular pieces which have been published in the Washington Post and elsewhere. He has founded several organizations addressing climate change, including historicalclimatology.com, a popular website that explains how the past can inform us about contemporary climate change. And he also co-hosts the podcast Climate History. Dakomar, welcome to Challenging Climate. Well, it's such a pleasure to join you both. Thank you for inviting me. Let's start a little bit about you and your life. You're an environmental historian. How did you end up an environmental historian studying the, uh, the interaction of climate and history? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I ask myself that sometimes, and I've been asked that many times, and I think my answer keeps changing. (laughs) And I keep going backwards further in time, maybe. I grew up in really the middle of nowhere, a little town called Waynefleet. And growing up there, I was always looking at the sky. And one of my first loves, really, was uh, meteorology, trying to figure out how the weather would change based on the clouds. And then also astronomy. There's not many buildings around. It was a big, big sky. So really, I came to science first, and I thought I would be either an astronomer or maybe a meteorologist, maybe a climatologist. But then it turns out I wasn't really all that great at math. (laughs) And I was also interested in history. So I started specializing in history in university and English. And then when I was actually doing graduate school, I realized that there was science that suggested that Earth's climate had changed even before the onset of human-caused global warming. I discovered that actually while reading a book about the origins of agriculture that connected the emergence of agriculture with climatic change. And I started thinking to myself, well, is it possible that the climate has changed more recently and that those more recent changes have actually impacted the history, for example, of early modern Europe, maybe the 17th century, the 16th century? That's how I discovered the Little Ice Age. I proposed a dissertation that would examine how the Little Ice Age affected the country in which I was born, the Netherlands during the 17th century. And then I finally discovered environmental history. There was this whole kind of history devoted to discovering how environmental changes have influenced the human story. So I decided, yeah, I'm going to be an environmental historian. That's how I got to where I am. Great. Um, So 
focusing in on the climate side of things, as I understand it, and please correct me, climate historians or historical climatology has sort of two sides. One is to do with reconstructing climates of the past, and another is how the climate affects society. So on that first one, how can climate historians help us better understand the climates of the past? Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of different terminologies here, I guess, to sort through, and it gets a little confusing. So there's historical climatologists and paleoclimatologists. And historical climatologists identify climate changes or reconstruct climate change using what we call the archives of societies. And then paleoclimatologists do the same thing using what they call the archives of nature. And so the archives of societies are just anything created by human beings that attests to how climate has changed in the past. And that can be direct observations of weather in surviving texts, that's often what we use, or it can be records of human activity that must have been very closely tied to climate change, like the use of particular harbors that might have been affected by sea ice in winter and therefore could not be operated in winter, or the dates of harvest, things that would have been importantly influenced by weather. Or even historical climatologists can use things like archaeological runes or oral histories in creative ways to gain less precise, what we might call lower resolution understandings of how climate has changed. Okay, so that's historical climatology because historical climatologists are limited to the human record and really in practical terms, often the human record of documentation, right, the textual record. Uh, historical climatologists can't go that far back in time usually. And so you also need paleoclimatologists. Paleoclimatologists, again, use those archives of nature, including rings and trees or layers and ice cores as proxies for past climatic changes. So the width of tree rings can be correlated to the amount that a tree grows in a growing season. And the amount that a tree grows in a growing season might be powerfully affected by temperature or precipitation, depending on the kind of tree, depending on the location of the tree. And then the ratio of heavy to light isotopes in those rings might also have a lot to tell us about temperature or precipitation. So you can use these changes in natural archives to figure out how climate has changed for thousands, even millions of years, even billions of years, depending on the proxy you use. So different proxies have different strengths and weaknesses. By combining them all, and ideally also with those archives of societies, you get some pretty robust reconstructions of past climate change. And that's partly how we know, of course, that what's happening now is so anomalous and frankly frightening as to these kinds of reconstructions. And then, yeah, you mentioned also climate history. Climate historians explore using historical sources how climate changes have influenced human societies, human populations. But in a recent article, which I'm sure we'll talk about, we argue or what's called the history of climate and society or HCS, which is a much more multidisciplinary understanding of that kind of work because archaeologists have been doing it for longer than historians. Geneticists are now involved, paleoclimatologists are involved as well. Many different scholars from many different disciplines are undertaking that kind of work using many sources other than historical sources. That's HCS. Great. So what are some of the classic examples of when a weather event or a shift in climate has affected the course of history or led to a civilization collapsing? <laughs> yeah, well, there's many. Uh, the last term you use there, collapsing, is probably a good place to start because I think the most influential studies in this field have focused on the collapse of empires, the collapse of societies. Um, some of the classic examples best known are the collapse of the classical Maya around the 11th century CE as a result of uh, long-term drought, the disappearance of Norse or Viking settlements in Western Greenland around the 15th century CE as a result, it's argued, of cooling and storminess, sea ice, more erratic weather, the disappearance of the Akkadian Empire or the collapse rather of the Akkadian Empire around the 5th century fifth millennium before present um, as a result of so-called mega drought, right? Drought that lasts for 30 years or longer. Some have argued that the collapse of the Western Roman Empire can be tied to the cooling of what's called the late antique Little Ice Age. So volcanic eruptions that then ultimately cooled the earth. Tambora volcanic eruption in 1815 in the wake of a mysterious eruption in 1809 have, has been associated with all kinds of disasters all over the earth. 
the transition between the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty in the 17th century CE and the turmoil that affected the Ottoman Empire around the same time, many other societies around the world. So many societies that Jeffrey Parker has called it a global crisis. Jeffrey Parker is a climate historian. That's another famous example. So there's a whole bunch of these examples, right, of uh, populations, either their society, their empire collapsed, or they were thrown into crisis and turmoil because of climatic change. Now, you did mention weather. So, of course, weather and climate change is different. Climate change happens over longer periods of time. So when you're talking about weather events specifically and how that's been tied to human history, it's actually interesting because fewer people have written about that. You need high resolution sources, precise sources in order to do that kind of work. And that is an important criticism of this kind of scholarship, that sometimes it's been imprecise. It's been focused too much on correlation and not enough on causation. And that's in part because the kind of sources that we might have available to us do not allow us always to talk about causation in these precise terms. But this is a very kind of 32,000 foot primer about some of the most charismatic examples that have been written about. One particular social phenomena that's received a fair amount of attention within the climate change community is the possible causal relationship between climate change and conflict and national and, and social security. It was a topic we touched on a little bit in our previous episode. We spoke with Nils Gilman, how this issue has been used politically. But scientifically, what can you say about the evidence of a causal relationship between climate change, anthropogenic or otherwise, and human conflict? Well, the first thing to say about that is that the science is not settled by any stretch of the imagination. And, and when I say science, I mean that in very broad terms, right? Because there's a lot of scholars working on this in many different disciplines. Political science might actually be the most important discipline involved in this kind of work. And I don't think we can say that there are any firm conclusions yet. We usually work on conflict in HCS, again, involves these kind of stories of collapse, right? Because conflict is viewed as a very important step that connects the climatic stimulus to the ultimate social outcome. And it's, uh, it's maybe best described in, again, Jeffrey Parker's conception of a fatal synergy between climatic change and other social ills. So in his conception, what happens is, well, the climate changes, and then harvests fail. And when they fail enough times, then there is famine and starvation in the countryside. Malnourished bodies are more vulnerable to outbreaks of epidemic disease. So there's also then epidemics that leads to depopulation and migration. Migration can bring epidemics to new regions. So the depopulation gets even worse. Mortality gets even worse. People who are desperate start to blame the government for their troubles. There's sedition, there's rebellion, there's wars within countries, and then different countries try and exploit the weaknesses of countries that are affected by civil war. So there can also be wars between countries. That, of course, leads to even more pressure on the countryside because armies plunder the countryside or demand resources from the countryside. So there's then a fatal synergy between the climatic stimulus, right? Famine, epidemic disease, warfare, that all leads to potentially a small climate change having a very outsized social outcome. And that is how we might get to these episodes of collapse, right? Even if the climatic change is originally quite small. So embedded within that idea, which has informed this field, what I call HCS, the history of climate and society for a very long time, is the idea that climatic change causes conflict. And there's been a lot of work more recently that finds correlations statistically between climate change and conflict. And this is a whole different sort of subfield of HCS that uses statistical means. And the idea there is if you can find these correlations between, let's say, the frequency of war and climatic change, then we've established a causal link right, between climatic change and conflict. And these studies probably have been most influential for tracking civil war in sub-Saharan Africa, I think especially of the work of Marshall Burke, which was very, still is extremely influential and important for policymakers. But really a pioneer in this work actually is from Hong Kong, his name is David Zhang. And he for a long time already has been tracking these correlations in imperial Chinese history where the textual evidence is extremely rich and dense. And you can try and find those kinds of correlations perhaps more effectively and over longer periods of time than you can anywhere else in the world. So from my perspective, a lot of this work can get pretty problematic 
pretty fast. And perhaps a good example of that involves a discourse around the Syrian civil war, where it looked like such an obvious example of a climate war. Right? There was a landmark drought, which seems to have been migration from the countryside to the outskirts of major cities. And at least at first, influential scientists said, well, the civil war against the Assad regime broke out in the outskirts of those cities because of discontent that migrants had with poor infrastructure um, that they were encountering in those cities. There were no accommodations made for them. Well, subsequent work has shown that things are much more complicated than that. But some of the original numbers of migrants, well, they were kind of pulled out of thin air. That drought affected some agricultural regions in Syria, but certainly not others. That the rebellion did not break out. And the outskirts of cities that were most affected by migration from the countryside, that involved longstanding grievances against the Assad regime, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So when you get into more precise, again, higher resolution sort of scholarship of what might have actually happened, the picture starts to look rather different. And that's also my concern with some of this correlation work. It's based on really broad trends that might unfold across years, decades, even centuries. But if you don't really have the high resolution understanding of causation, then you can get into the same problem as uh, what we got into with the Syrian civil war, where you're assuming there's connections that actually turn out to be much more tenuous. In my opinion, I've argued this in a, a number of different articles recently, you spend too much time thinking about the origins of war, what causes war. We haven't spent enough time thinking about how preparations for war actually make or can make populations more vulnerable to climate change. We haven't spent enough time thinking about how war might make populations more vulnerable to climate change after it unfolds. And we certainly haven't spent enough time considering how climate change affects the outcome of wars that are already underway. So there are dimensions to this question that we're only starting to approach. And I think a lot more scholarship is needed there. So as, as you're saying, this is a very, very complicated area to work in. To understand these problems, you've got to understand many different disciplines or have colleagues that do. How, how has this field developed? I mean, my first contact with this kind of idea was Jared Diamond's Collapse. That was published in 2005, where you know, he tracked various societies that collapsed due to environmental pressures from without or from within, and he tracked their various responses. How have ideas changed? Well, how did they develop up until that point? What mistakes were made and how have they improved since then? The history of the field is really fascinating, I have to say, and I'm learning more and more about it, actually, over the last year and a half or so. So let me give you the sort of classic narrative of how the field developed and then some of the things I've, I've maybe learned over the last year and a half. So the classic narrative is that there was an astronomer, A.E. Douglas, in the late 19th century, and he was actually uh, Percival Lowell's assistant. Lowell, I don't know, the story has been kind of lost over time, but he argued that there were canals on Mars and that the canals were an effort of an alien civilization to stave off its collapse as a result of climate change on Mars. It's kind of funny to think about that. Maybe in some ways the origins of the field involve that story. But anyway, A.E. Douglas eventually became discontented with this work. Maybe there are, in fact, the evidence for canals isn't as good as, uh, as Percival Lowell is saying. So he uh, started looking around at different work that he could do. He landed on the idea that the sun actually affected the environment of Earth, which was then a very controversial idea. And ultimately, he discovered that the rings in trees around the Southwest could be correlated to weather, in particular to drought. And from that, we get some of the first climate reconstructions using the archives of nature. Now, that work was encouraged by, and then joined by in some ways, geographer Ellsworth Huntington, who was able to use then these reconstructions using tree rings to argue that over long periods of time, the climate has not been stable, and that the instability of climate ultimately caused the rise and fall of great empires. And so that work wasn't really taken seriously at the time. It was based on kind of crude correlation. And the field kind of fell into disrepute, I guess, until the 1960s and 1970s, when scholars in different disciplines, including importantly, historians like Emmanuel Leroy Laderie, reinvented the field, made it much more precise, made it much more focused on what could be known rather than just what could be guessed. And ultimately, the field has grown very rapidly in the last couple of decades as concerns about global warming of course, have dramatically increased. People are looking for different perspectives on what might happen in the future. 
but then also importantly, as climate reconstructions have grown much more precise. So that's the kind of classic story of the origins of the field. What I found interesting over the last year and a half is just discovering the extent to which these ideas have their origins even in antiquity, or even in some of the oldest myths where these ideas of rapid changes in sea levels. Maybe you could even associate that with the end of the Younger Dryas and the last glacial maximum and the dramatic sea level increases that happened then. Maybe those myths have their origins in that. And then also figuring out the extent to which, for me anyway, people were talking about climate changing and civilizations collapsing even in the 18th century, even in the 17th century, actually. And that's in part because they were figuring out that Earth's climate was not stable. Even then, they reinterpreted evidence of marine fossils in areas that are today land to figure out, okay, well, climate has not been stable. Maybe the Earth is much older than we thought. And then they discovered that the sun's output could also change. They figured that sunspots could have an impact on solar output. So the world started looking a lot less stable to them than they had thought. And they grew very worried about what's called Malthusian traps, that there could be some kind of change in the environment that causes a Malthusian crisis and that makes theirs, might make their society more vulnerable to famine and starvation. So these ideas actually have very, very old origins. And what we have to be careful about in this field is that we don't replicate deeply problematic ideas. And I'll give you one example of that, probably the key example, which is the idea that there can exist an ideal climate for civilization and that therefore some parts of the world were more, were more supportive of advanced civilization than others. This is a, a really problematic idea from European imperialism. And you certainly see it in the works of Ellsworth Huntington, who was a eugenicist. And you can see it continuing to appear in recent studies of collapse, this idea that you could have a climate that was ideal for a high civilization that could then change and the civilization would devolve in a sense. And so this is, I think, a, a very dangerous way of looking at human history and an inaccurate way of doing so. I guess on that, maybe on that particular point, it seems that one of the key steps between climate and society is agriculture. And in some respects, I mean, the Arctic isn't particularly productive and deserts aren't particularly productive. What role does tracking and understanding agricultural productivity have in um, the history of climate and our relation with it? Well, it can have a, a tremendously important role. Absolutely. And when we think about the future too, right? I mean, what's the biggest fear that we have? That we won't be able to grow enough food, right? I mean, that's the number one reason that people fear collapse, I think, in the future. And in the past as well, I think HCS scholars have long focused on subsistence strategies, which of course is a big, bit broader than, than agriculture. Different populations have many different ways of sustaining themselves. There's a classic divide between pastoralism and agriculture, right? And some of those ways might have been more or less effective, might have been more or less what we call resilient in the face of climate change. I think in general, it is true that populations that depended on one or two staple crops, especially those grown in marginal lands, could be more vulnerable to climatic change. And many of the studies of collapse and crisis have focused on populations, have focused on empires where that wasn't that the case. Conversely, those populations that had flexible and diverse subsistence strategies seem to have been more resilient in the face of climate change because the climatic change could not necessarily reduce the availability or accessibility of all those different kinds of food. And actually, we can see examples of that in the Arctic. Maybe one of the classic examples from Western Greenland, again, is the dichotomy between the Norse, the Viking subsistence strategy in Greenland, and that of the Thule, who migrated south into Greenland while the Norse were already there and were able to use more sophisticated technology to harvest seals year round, whereas the Norse really depended on pastoral practices and to some extent increasingly also on hunting migratory seals. So the Thule had access to more diverse and uh, more constant food sources than the Norse, and that's probably why they thrived. And the Norse absolutely did not when the climate changed. In this field though, the way we often think about this, at least for the last couple of millennia, is to consider changes in food prices and then kind of correlate those changes in food prices with changes in climate. And sometimes this is done with those kind of statistical approaches that I mentioned to you earlier. In fact, many of the most influential studies use those statistical approaches. But again, I would argue that by doing that, we don't really think about the actual practice of agriculture on the ground, which is a potential criticism of the field. So we don't really look at how farmers are changing their crops, are trying to respond. There's some examples of this, Heli Hutama, 
is a scholar who has done great work. My PhD student, I should shout out to her as well. Emma Mosswild is also beginning to do this kind of work. But these approaches, actually looking at agricultural practice on the ground, are still in their infancy. And I think that's where the field kind of has to move. But I will say that I think we should consider getting beyond agriculture and beyond growing food. Of course, that's important. But we tend to assume that climate change most directly affects populations, all populations, through food production. And I don't necessarily think that's the case. Uh, in my research, for example, I found some pretty profound impacts of climatic change on how war can be fought or on how you can move. And I can't agree that the impacts of climatic change on food production are more direct or even necessarily more important than its impacts on those other ways of organizing human activity. So I think we have to be a little cautious in assuming that food production is always going to be most directly and most importantly affected by climate change in different populations. So your review article is quite critical of the field. You, you've mentioned a few of those criticisms already, but what are some of the big biases and other issues that you want to mention when tackling history and climate? Yeah, I, it is critical of the field. <laughs> that's, that's true. But it's a, it's a kind of criticism that I think has been anticipated by other scholars. I think it's, um, it's actually an amalgamation, more than anything, of critical approaches that scholars in the field have had for a while now and maybe discontentment with certain elements of the field. Uh, so yeah, I, I've mentioned a few of them. One that I would say as well that actually motivated me to begin putting together the team that wrote the article is this idea, right, that we have a sort of systemic bias in how we organize and how we develop publications in the field and try and identify relationships. We've been so focused on crisis and catastrophe. And that's usually because we come across climate change as a way of explaining some sort of inexplicable event, otherwise inexplicable event in history, usually some sort of disaster, right? Because those are best documented. Those are most sensational. Those tend to influence and inspire a lot of scholarship. So we, we usually try and write articles in this field to explain disasters. And of course, that means that at least in the discipline of history, the overwhelming majority of articles are focused on catastrophe. And even in archaeology, which is focused a lot more on resilience and adaptation than history, the most influential studies, I would argue, focus on collapse. So there's been a kind of systemic bias in how we sort of identify moments that we connect to climate change, historical moments that we connect to climate change. And as a result, by, by reading the field, you might gain the impression that climate change has always caused collapse and crisis. And I would argue that that has led us to overlook a lot of examples of adaptation and resilience that are no less important, either for us trying to uh, gain insights into the future or for us to understand how populations have actually you know, experienced climate change in the past. We've been talking at a fairly abstract level about the field and the methods and insights, potential biases, et cetera. Let's spend a few minutes diving into a case study. This was the topic of your book, published in 2018 on Cambridge University Press, The Frigid Golden Age, Climate Change of the Little Ice Age in the Dutch Republic, 1560 to 1720, focuses in on the country of your birth. During the Little Ice Age, which for those unfamiliar with it, it was a cold spell lasting from the roughly the 16th to the 19th century. And what struck me most, of course, at the most general level are two things. First of all, that the Netherlands is a relatively cold country to begin with, and yet it thrived. It reached its literal golden age during an abnormally cold period, which seems at first glance counterintuitive. And the second thing that surprised me is that at least your book, consistent with what you just said, doesn't emphasize agriculture or sea level rise or sea level decline, I suppose that might be the case during a cold spell. But instead, the three main sections of the books are dedicated to three key aspects of society. And maybe we can work through each of these in turn. And the first of these is commerce and colonies. And as you hinted at a moment ago, ways of moving around. So how did a abnormally cold period of, of a few centuries impact how the Dutch could move and trade around the world? 
Sure, let me back up just a little bit, beginning to answer that question, just to provide a tiny bit more context on the Little Ice Age and how it's been written about, maybe. And then, yeah, I'd love to get into the commerce stuff. Um, Little Ice Age, the first thing to emphasize about it is that it's a period of modest cooling. And I think this is really important because, well, this is actually one of the criticisms we have in that Nature article, that scholars in these disciplines that focus on the past history and archaeology often misinterpret climate reconstructions developed by paleoscientists, for example, right? So in a bunch of different publications, the Little Ice Age is viewed as this period where temperatures cool by two degrees Celsius, something extreme like that, right? Which would make it bigger than global warming has been so far, a lot bigger. Well, it was much smaller than global warming, at least in magnitude. We're talking about a cooling of, of not more than half a degree Celsius in the Northern Hemisphere during the coldest decades of the period. So it's, it's modest compared to global warming has already been. It also came in a series of waves that reached different places at different times. So it was not globally homogenous, unlike global warming as today. But it did alter precipitation patterns in many parts of the world. So that in the Southern Hemisphere, it might be more accurate, as a uh, colleague Sugata Ray says, to talk of a little drought age uh, as opposed to a little ice age. So this is a complicated period. The way it's been written about by people like me is, well, there's been a focus on crisis and collapse, right? We talked about the Greenlandic Norse. That's maybe the most charismatic example of one of these collapses. But there's a bunch of other ones that people write about. Depopulation of Angkor is a good example in present-day Cambodia. And just there's been this focus on crisis, this identification of waves of crisis across Europe and across the world in different cold parts, dry parts of the Little Ice Age. So that's the kind of story I wanted to write <laughs> originally uh, when I approached the Frigid Golden Age. I, I, first of all, I, I didn't know that people had written a bunch of these accounts already. And I just assumed, well, when climate changes, then societies fall into crisis and, and maybe they collapse. And, you know, I, I discovered, yeah, there were some political crises in the Dutch Republic that overlapped with periods of cooling. So, OK, so yeah, maybe this makes sense. But then soon enough, I realized, well, wait a minute. I mean, this is a period when population of this little country doubles, urbanization rates soar, per capita wealth is maybe higher than anywhere else in the world. There's so much art on everybody's wall, pretty much, that we still think of it, many people still think of it as a golden age. Those terms are contested now, but anyway, a golden age. For the people who live at least in the coastal cities of this society, I mean, by and large, they thrive and they realize it. They were writing about how much they were thriving, how rich they were. So that was a kind of paradox for me, exactly as you say, right? Because I thought, yeah, I mean, this is a country that is very vulnerable to its environment, to environmental conditions, right? A large part, the richest part of the country uh, moved well beneath sea level from the time it was drained in the medieval centuries, the high medieval centuries. And so any sort of changes in storminess, I figure, is, are, that's going to cause a lot of problems. And it did, actually. There were these massive floods in the 16th and 17th century that carried away thousands of people, killed thousands of animals. So there were disasters like that. And I figured, yeah, OK, so this is a cold country. Now already it can be pretty chilly, um, although not by Canadian standards, which is where I'm from. And I figured, well, OK, so if it's already pretty chilly and months in the winter these days, you can get pretty close to freezing. What happens in this watery country when it's below freezing for large periods of time? That must have had a big impact. But so I was really surprised to find out that the relationships were not as straightforward as I thought. And eventually I landed on, OK, I'm going to look at the best documented aspects of the society and then also maybe those aspects of the society that made it most distinct compared to other societies. And commerce was a huge part of that. In the 16th and the 17th, 18th centuries, to some extent, the Dutch Republic became the most important trading country in Europe and then ultimately throughout large parts of the globe, especially the Indian Ocean. Dutch merchants dominated waterborne trade across Europe. The Republic itself was crisscrossed with a network of canals and roads and rivers and other transportation systems that linked its centers of population in a way that very few other contemporary states had linked population centers through the Dutch East India Company, dominated the trade in rich and high value goods from Asia into Europe, and then also the intra-Asian trade. So connecting different ports and population centers across Asia, across the Indian Ocean, the Dutch East India Company became increasingly important especially in the 18th century in that trade. The West India Company was centered on the Atlantic, ultimately became a key player in Brazil when that was Dutch Brazil for a while, but also parts of North America 
And then particularly when it was reformed, became a very important player in the slave trade, obviously from West Africa into the Western Hemisphere. Something like 5%, I believe, of all slaves from Africa were transported on WIC ships. Uh, but a lot of that transportation was concentrated in a relatively small amount of time. So Dutch commerce becomes incredibly important. And it was a real challenge for me to figure out how to write about this. Um, at the time I was writing, I, I believed that climate reconstructions were not high resolution enough to write about production of essential commodities outside of parts of the Northern Hemisphere. So I decided to focus on movement, which had really very few people had written about that. And then how changes in atmospheric circulation across the Atlantic and Indian Oceans might have affected how quickly Dutch ships could move and maybe how vulnerable they were to, let's say, storminess. So I thought a lot about, yeah, wind as a power source and how that could allow ships to move in different directions at different speeds. And then actually even more fundamentally, what it meant for this society to depend so much on this power source of wind as compared to the, the energy source of temperature that allows crops to grow more or less effectively or precipitation, right? Wind was really much more important for the Dutch than it was for many other societies in the contemporary world that did not rely on that kind of commerce. So ultimately, I argued, yeah, that there was an increase in the speed of Dutch ships to Asia in the 17th century as a result of changing wind patterns in the Atlantic Ocean. But then also looking at Dutch travel within the Republic itself and within Europe, I focused much more on resilience, the ability of Dutch merchants and inventors and sailors and Dutch people of all different stripes to figure out, okay, how are we going to cope with less predictable weather, icier weather? What kind of technologies can we invent? How we, can we keep these waterborne networks of communication open, even when things get really cold? And they were able to do it. And that includes like ordinary farmers in the Dutch Republic. They were able to use hybrid sleds and boats to get where they needed to go and to keep shipments of fresh water coming into Amsterdam, for example. And uh, what really struck me was the ability of ordinary people, not just big companies, sometimes big evil companies, but ordinary people to figure out how to cope on a very local level. The second aspect of the Dutch Republic in the so-called golden era that you focus on is the military. And obviously, weather is widely discussed as having impacts on military activities, but climate is something different. It's a long-term average. How did the Dutch military fare in the Little Ice Age? Well, the Dutch military fared overall quite well, although and this is the case with many aspects of the book and, and many elements of these relationships, there were advantages and disadvantages. And soldiers and their leaders cope more or less effectively with those different pressures. So I have a chapter in there about what, what are, is sometimes called the Dutch War of Independence or the 80 Years War, which is the long Dutch effort to break free of the Spanish Empire. The provinces that became the Dutch Republic were actually part of the Spanish Empire in the 16th century. And this was very much a David versus Goliath fight because the Spanish Empire was one of the world's great empires in the 16th century, along with the Ottoman Empire, kind of vied for dominance within Europe, France, I guess, as well. And, you know, in terms of the population of the provinces that became the Dutch Republic, it was so much smaller than that of the Spanish Empire. And the Spanish Empire had this army of Flanders, which was the most feared force in 16th century Europe. And it just seemed like it would be no contest at first. And the Dutch, ultimately, the Dutch victory, which was um, solidified in 1648, you know, it was a result of a whole bunch of different influences. But one of them, I argue in the book, uh, was climate change. The climate in the 16th century became cooler as a result of another one of these cold waves of the Little Ice Age, but then also as a result of different circulatory patterns in the atmosphere, a bit wetter over the low countries. And that had different contradictory influences, the Spanish effort to reclaim provinces of the Dutch Republic. So first of all, cooler, well, that had mixed benefits for the Spaniards, for their armies. Because if it was cold, the rivers that otherwise provided a kind of defensive barrier around uh, the Dutch Republic, they would freeze over and allow the Spanish to easily cross. And that was pretty bad if you were Dutch. And that also then, of course, allowed the Spanish to cross over the watery environments around key fortresses and cities, which normally, again, provided impediments for their advance. And at the same time, however, when it was cold, the Spanish might have to besiege cities during exceptionally severe frigid weather. 
And this is because, in part, of a new kind of way of fighting that was imported from Italy through uh, what's called the Italian bastion, a kind of revolutionary fortress that allowed fortresses and cities to absorb artillery bombardment, made them much more difficult to claim by an invading army. So war was fought through these kind of grueling sieges. And when you were encamped around the city in bitterly cold little Ice Age winters, could be extremely dangerous, especially if you used up all the fuel to make fires that was readily available around that city. And, you know, the low countries are not particularly well forested, to put it mildly, especially back then. So as a result of that, many Spanish soldiers died. He just camped out in the field and Spanish armies repeatedly mutinied in order to stay in winter quarters rather than besiege cities in the winter. So cooling had very mixed benefits for the Spanish. Heavy precipitation in the low countries provided even more important advantages to the defender, however, because when you besiege the city, you would dig lines of fortification around that city, trenches basically, that could be extremely long. And in order to do that, you actually had to be able to dig in soil that wasn't just complete mud. And in order to stay healthy in those fortifications, it really helped if they weren't just crumbling and falling apart and just wet and miserable. You can find examples of that from World War I as well, right, where soldiers had to cope with trench foot because it was rainy and they were stuck in trenches. Very similar relationships in the 16th century, where soldiers found they just could not besiege cities because it was too wet. Then finally, the Dutch had it, and actually some Spanish also had a technique of intentionally flooding the environments around cities in order to make them truly impossible to besiege or in order to wash away besieging armies. And those floods, as you can imagine, when it was very wet and raining a lot, stormy, they could be much more effective than otherwise. And they, the most famous example, literally washed away a Spanish army that was besieging the fortress town of Leiden in, if memory serves, 1574. So there are all these relationships there, right? Some of them benefit the Dutch, some of them benefit the Spanish um, when the Dutch were able to go on the offensive in the 1590s, they actually suffered from exactly the heavy precipitation that disadvantaged the Spanish earlier. So it's a complex sort of mix of advantages and disadvantages in the wars of independence. Later, when the Republic was a great power in Europe, it fought a series of wars primarily against England, but then ultimately against France and a couple of German cities, really for a dominance of commerce within Europe and elsewhere. These are called the Anglo-Dutch Wars of the 17th century. And again, there's a contradictory mix of influences. This was fought during another, the onset of another cold wave of the Little Ice Age. And cooling uh, made it harder for the Dutch to use their waterborne networks of internal transport and communication, and thereby actually made it harder for the Dutch to prepare their fleet in the spring and to stock their fleet and to finish building large warships. So in that sense, cooling had some pretty big impediments for the Dutch. But also, as a result of changes to atmospheric pressure over the North Atlantic Ocean, at least in part because of that, atmospheric circulation again changed so that winds from the east were a bit more common during the second and third of these Anglo-Dutch wars than they were during the first war. And that gave Dutch fleets repeatedly the advantage of something called the weather gauge, which is what you wanted to have in the age of sail, where the, uh, you are between the origin of the wind and your enemy. And that gave you the opportunity to choose when and how to attack and retreat, which was viewed as a major tactical advantage at the time. And so just because of the geography of where Dutch fleets were sailing into battle most of the time, they usually had that advantage of the weather gauge and were able to exploit it to win most of the battles in the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Wars, even when they were greatly outnumbered, and ultimately to win those wars. Now, again, there was a whole bunch of other stuff going on, too. There were efforts by the Dutch to build large ships that were capable of taking on larger English ships and using different tactics like the line of battle tactics, which the English had refined. So there were all kinds of human changes that coincided with, and in some cases reinforced, the advantages of and the changes of climate that were happening at the time. And finally, quite different from, certainly from military, as well as from commerce, is culture. The third part of your book dives into Dutch culture, which during this era is, of course, known as a peak achievement in the history of the Netherlands, the output of painters especially. How did the Little Ice Age shape Dutch culture during this time? Well, it was a lot of fun to write those chapters and fun to think about. I think my favorite elements of that relationship to write about involved the development of new technologies, which uh, had really not been explored much uh, yet before I wrote those chapters. 
In particular, it was fun to, to think about the kinds of vehicles uh, that the Dutch designed in order to travel more easily over ice, like the ice wagon, which is kind of a mix between a sailing ship and a wagon that used the sail to go really fast in high winds over the ice at a speed that astonished contemporaries in the 17th century. And it was made to transport messages uh, really fast uh, from one part of the Republic to the other. But then also inventions like skates, which come from the Little Ice Age in the Low Countries, and icebreakers, which were refined by brewers' guilds to maintain waterborne lines of transportation into cities for the transportation of fresh water, for example, and even fire departments and fire engines and fire hoses, which were developed partly in response to the Great Fire of London um, in 1666, which in turn was a consequence of two things, drought, and then also those easterly winds pushing the flames into downtown London. So it's, it was a lot of fun to write about technology, but then also to think about, well, were the Dutch actually aware that their climate was changing and how can we figure that out? And I found evidence of the Dutch doing exactly what a historical climatologist would do today, which is consult textual sources to find changes in uh, the frequency, at least of weather extremes. And they were able to deduce, okay, when an extreme storm happened or an extreme winter, well, these winters might be getting more extreme or, you know, this is the most extreme winter in 80 years. And often they were right about reaching those conclusions. Um, they were not able to track changes in weather averages at the time. That would depend on breakthroughs in statistical thinking that were largely happened in the 19th century. But they were able to sort of track changes in weather extremes, uh, which I found really interesting. And then the question, of course, is, well, are they developing these new practices and technologies Again, because they're aware of those extremes becoming more frequent or more severe. And that I wasn't able to find. I wasn't able to find any sort of smoking gun evidence of that. But I did explore changes in, in art and how different genres of art realistically depicted the weather of the Little Ice Age. Storms, for example, that affected fleets or wind changes in wind directions that influenced how battles could unfold. There were, in fact, artists who were embedded in contemporary fleets, like journalists who were embedded in armies during the Iraq War, for example, or even now in the war in Ukraine, whose job it was to realistically depict how battles unfolded, and I guess also the environmental conditions in which battles were fought. And they, sure enough, were able to depict the weather of the Little Ice Age. I found a more tenuous connection between what are called winter landscapes, and the Little Ice Age, the development of a genre of landscape painting that depicted winters has often been tied to the cooling of the Little Ice Age. But in fact, these winter landscapes were sold alongside depictions of other seasons. And they were not painted outside, they were painted in workshops. So it's kind of difficult to say that they're really showing what's going on outside. Um, nevertheless, they do show how Dutch consumers are purchasing these uh, depictions of winter, but also more importantly, the kinds of activities that might have been more common in winter weather. So skating, for example, ice fairs, all that kind of stuff. You can see it in these landscapes. So and then even I, I look at things like map making, how different and in many cases more accurate maps of the north were able to be drawn because journeys of exploration to the north were redirected by new patterns of sea ice and, and things like that. So yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in those culture chapters that was a lot of fun to write about. So bringing this up to date now, I think it seems clear from your work and the work of your colleagues that climate change isn't fate. How societies fared was a matter of the changes in the environment, but also their adaptations to it. So what lessons do you draw from your study of history and climate for our hopes for the future? Well, the first thing we should emphasize is that human-caused global warming is different than the Little Ice Age, and it's unfolding in a different world than the world of the Little Ice Age, right? So already we talked about how the magnitude of human-caused global warming is about double, more than double that of the Little Ice Age, and we are on course for maybe three degrees Celsius of total warming by the end of this century, although great uncertainties remain. So... When you're comparing global warming to the Little Ice Age, you have to bear in mind that these things are of a different magnitude and, you know, they have different causes or forcings, as, as we call them, right, which also changes the level of threat that they present for us. And, of course, global warming is much more globally homogenous than the Little Ice Age was. So there's a fundamental difference there. There's also 8 billion people, obviously, living on our planet. And we're putting all kinds of pressure on environments around the world that, well, there was not that kind of pressure in the 16th century, put it that way. 
So there's a fundamental difference there. And part of the challenge in answering that question for people like me is determining to what extent we can make those kinds of connections, right? To what extent the past can offer any sort of guide for the future. And if you would say that the past can offer no guide because things are so different now, um, then I would not, I would argue with you, but I would understand where you're coming from. Uh, that's a totally reasonable claim to make. However, first of all, predicting the future is always going to be a very challenging prospect, right? And any sort of way of doing that is going to be problematic and flawed. And even imperfect evidence can be better than nothing. And so that is why I feel almost an obligation to try and find what useful knowledge we can in the past that can help us to sort of maybe inform activism and then also inform policy. I think an important lesson of the past is that even those populations that were confronted with extreme regional climate changes, because even though we're talking about globally modest climate changes, regionally, the story could be quite different. Well, and exactly as you put it, their outcomes were as influenced by the magnitude of that change as they were by the characteristics of their society. And what that means, of course, is that there is a likelihood that adaptation, if we're smart about it, that adaptation can mitigate some of the effects of global warming for contemporary populations. And what kind of adaptations then, the question is for me, were most effective in the past? One of them that I've really emphasized in a lot of my popular work is the kind of adaptation that provided for the poorest people in society, either because the society at the time that there was not much of a difference between the poorest and the richest, right? That there was uh, social economic equality within that society, or because the society provided very, very effectively for the poor. And this is something we see in the Dutch Republic as well. A grossly unequal society, yes, but in coastal cities of the Dutch Republic, there was a strong tradition of civic charity that was able to, in many cases, provide enough food for the poor who elsewhere would be the most vulnerable uh, to harvest failures and, and would die off in huge numbers. So then also, okay, so the, how does that change how we view adaptation today? Well, it might make us more uh, amenable to policies in the Green New Deal, for example, right? Which imagine a kind of whole of society response to climate change, where addressing environmental justice, racial gender inequalities is a part of climate adaptation. So that's one way, I think a pretty concrete way in which the lessons of the past might make us favor one set of policies over others that maybe prioritize infrastructural changes as means of adaptation. We need a whole of society approach to adaptation. Other things we point to in our resilience article uh, would be things like maintaining redundancies and diverse networks of trade. Um, so much of our society right now is uh, in our trade connections privilege efficiency over redundancy because redundancy is viewed as inefficient. Whereas in fact, I think those societies that were resilient in the face of climate change, like the Dutch Republic, were able to have very diverse sources from which they derived their essential commodities and redundancies in that, for example, there were many different ways of getting from one region to the other, or many different places you could draw from if things dried up in one area versus another. So that kind of prioritization of redundancy is actually longstanding in climate policy debates. People were talking about it already in the 1970s, at least. But the examples of the past, I think, maybe make that more obvious and more important or confirm that that, that is essential. Another thing would be, well, in our resilience article, we talk a lot about migration, how migration has been perhaps the ultimate means of adapting to climate change. And of course, we anticipate a large increase in the number of migrants in this century. How large is up for debate? Uh, what that looks like example is up for debate. But it seems obvious to me that if migration is an adaptation, a successful adaptation to climate change, that we should try and normalize and accommodate it, particularly in those rich countries that are most responsible for the climate crisis so far. So we also emphasize that, that we need to think of ways not to ban migration or to criminalize it, but to facilitate and to welcome it to the extent that's possible especially in rich countries like the United States. So those are a few different lessons that I think that we might learn from the past. And maybe one more, one more that's important and that touches more on mitigation. And that is that relatively small climate changes we learned from this field have had outsized impacts on populations, right? Again, a little ice age, we're really talking about modest climate change. And so we should be very careful in accepting that we're going to warm the world by two degrees Celsius or two and a half degrees Celsius, or view that as some sort of policy success, right? Because every tenth of a degree Celsius really matters. And the past does tell us that 
So if we can move heaven and earth to limit climate change to 1.5 degrees Celsius, the past tells us that we should do that and make that a uh, priority. So that is a kind of warning that the past can give us. This is not all like, yeah, we can adapt to climate change. It's also, this is a real threat. Great. Well, we like to end on an, on an optimistic note. So just to sort of make that a little more difficult, we, we've been talking about a few of these recent articles, I mean, recent podcasts about doom, about the fact that many, uh, many young people feel that we're doomed because of climate change. And, and you wrote a recent piece in the Washington Post countering some of that. So um, why are you more optimistic about the future than some? Yeah, I mean, that's always a question about what it means. What is optimism these days, <laughs> right? So I think I should start by saying, I think this is, you know, most people in our field would, would agree with this. Climate change is going to cause tremendous amounts of devastation, already is. The climate crisis is here. And, you know, the people most affected in many places are going to be those who have been historically marginalized and continue to be marginalized. Ecosystems are being transformed, will be increasingly transformed, so that the world of the 21st century is going to look very different. And uh, that's why I began that Washington Post article by kind of mourning almost that fate. And especially if you have, you have small children like I do, you worry about that obsessively, I think. Especially, you know, again, if, if you're in this field. See, I don't view myself as an optimist in that sense. I lose a lot of sleep over this. But at the same time, I do not think that we are doomed. I don't think there's good evidence for that at this point. And I say at this point because maybe five years ago, the evidence was better. <laughs> when it seemed like we were on course to warm the earth by maybe four degrees Celsius or more by the end of the century. Now, it seems owing to a number of different things, including effective climate policy and related to that, the plummeting cost of renewables, that we are currently on a mid-range emissions scenario, which means that we will likely, if current policies remain the same and are not adjusted in light of COP26, we will likely warm the planet by just under three degrees Celsius with significant uncertainties. Uh, we might get less than that, or we might get significantly more than that, depending on what's called, of course, climate sensitivity, so how sensitive the Earth is to our emissions. But we, if things remain the same, we might get to that number. If governments actually apply their COP26 pledges, we might get to just under two degrees Celsius. If there's also equal momentum from corporations and movement and carbon removal technologies, maybe, and other things, we might get to significantly, well, several tenths of a degree Celsius, less than that. So does that mean we're doomed at that level of warming? First of all, you have to ask who's we. And then second of all, you have to ask what is doomed. But if by doomed, you mean that the human race is going to go extinct, which is, I think, often what people mean when they say that, then I would say that there's no good evidence for that. If by doomed, you mean that our societies are going to be significantly affected by that and poorer because of that than we might have been, and food sources are going to be less secure than they might otherwise have been, then I think there's a good chance if we get, certainly if we get to three degrees Celsius, that yes, that will be the case. With the impacts, again, thinking about the we question, disproportionately felt by the most marginalized populations in our society. Again, one reason why environmental justice and adaptation to re and to promote environmental justice is so important. So I think these are important messages to get out there because I think, well, denialism is the biggest threat that we face right now, frankly, right? I mean, I, at least to me, I feel like there's it's hard to debate that. But I also believe that doomism has the potential to reduce the kind of momentum behind activism right now, and perhaps actually even force climate change lower on the list of priorities here in the United States for Democratic voters, for example. Because if we're all doomed anyway, what's the point of doing anything about this? And, you know, just the other day I was at a wedding and the bride's father turned to me and said, well, as far as I know, I think the, it's done, isn't it? You know, we've lost control of climate change and there's nothing we can do about it. So why are we even bothering? And I told him, this is not true, right? It's not true. We still have tremendous scope for action. And what we do in the next couple of decades will reverberate for thousands of years. And we can do it. I mean, it's possible to do it right now. We need the political will. And we're not doomed. So I think that's a really important message to get out there. And I should say also that other people have gotten it out there very, very effectively, and you know, perhaps more effectively than me. I think of Kate Marvel and Zeki Housefather. There's so many great climate communicators right now reinforcing that message. And it's so frustrating, profoundly frustrating to me that we seem to have gone straight from denialism to doomism. 
without spending much time in between. I, I know that's a simplification, but uh, I think that our media environment, as I point out in the Washington Post article, also promotes those kinds of extremes, sensational extremes. I think that's very toxic for our ability to actually get any sort of climate policy done. So anyway, I would also forward you to those other climate communicators and uh, I am hopeful at least that we won't go extinct. <laughs> Maybe that's a good note to close on. <laughs> I think it is. All right. It's not black, it's not white, it's somewhere in those shades of gray. And there's lots that we can do to make it brighter. All right. Well, thanks, Digimar, for joining us. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for listening. Please rate or review us on Apple Podcasts and elsewhere, and consider supporting us on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash challengingclimate.